afternoon from India and uh, uh, welcome uh, each and every one of you who has made it a point to be here online uh, to be a part of the second episode of Expert Library. Uh, to uh, For viewers who are just tuning in, uh, Expert Library is a monthly segment in our YouTube channel, Literal Broadcast, in which we would uh, bring subject experts from all over the world to, to give you a uh, world-class lecture about a specific topic in English literature. And uh, uh, whenever we host an episode of Expert Library, we tend to choose a very special date. And uh, in this uh, particular day, we, uh, we chose this particular day because uh, this day is claimed to be the first uh, uh, time or the date that uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes stories were first published. And hence we named this day as uh, Scarlet Holmes Day because the first story that Sherlock Holmes actually appears to be uh, the Scarlet uh, uh, Letter, <laughs> if I'm uh, right. So, uh, uh, with uh, nothing uh, further to add, I would like to ask uh, Dr. P. Sashikla to give a brief, brief introduction about today's subject expert. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, greetings to all. Uh, we, we have with us Dr. Samuel Saunders, researcher from United Kingdom. He's performing extensive research and analyzing findings and data. He writes extensive reports and publishes completed work in multi-formatted academic publications. He also disseminates research findings to specialist audience through verbal and written channels. Dr. Saunders develops research networks and works collaboratively across institutions. He enjoys designing and delivering teaching and assessment to undergraduate and postgraduate students in the form of lectures, seminars, workshops, and tutorials. We have such a knowledgeable person with us today to share his knowledge in the area of crime and detective fiction, which is his area of interest. So, over to you, sir. Okie dokie. Thank you very much. I'm just going to share my screen because I have a... Uh a PowerPoint presentation for everybody to look at. Um, I'm just going to double check that everyone can see that. Is that working OK? Yeah, OK. So let's make a start then. OK, so th um, firstly, an enormous thank you uh, for that wonderful introduction and for inviting me to come along and be a part uh, of this podcast today. It's an absolute pleasure uh, to be here. And today what I want to do is revisit um, some of the history of crime fiction, uh, British crime fiction across the 19th century. That's my area uh, of interest. So I study the Victorians and their connection to crime fiction and, and policing and detection and real sort of crimes um, and the connections between those two things and also the periodical and, and, and journalistic kind of press that was appearing around the same time. Um, so I'll go into some more detail about how I want to revisit the kind of history of crime fiction in a second. Um, but in essence, the way that the genre's evolution is kind of viewed, both within a kind of academic context and without, um, is usually perceived as quite linear, moving from one genre, uh, or sorry, one author or text to the next and then to the next and then to the next and then so on. So to, to present a chronology of the genre's evolution. And I think this is largely kind of problematic and sort of untrue. So I want to use this lecture today to talk about the connections between Victorian newspaper and periodical journalism and the evolution of crime fiction with a focus on kind of space and place to begin to counteract and redress this problem. And I think we can uh, in the future kind of develop these ideas outwards to begin to rethink the ways that in which we view the evolution and development of literary genre more generally, because the sort of linear approach to it is simply just kind of not true and is not limited to crime fiction either. Um, so this lecture is built on material utilised and arranged as a, as a result of my own research. So I'm going to be covering quite a lengthy historical period and a significant amount of content from quite a top down perspective. Um, so hopefully it won't move too quickly um, and uh, any, any kind of questions we can redress at the end. Um, so it's first, firstly worth briefly restating what the generally accepted chronology of Victorian crime fiction actually is, um, both inside and outside of an academic setting. And most kind of generally accept that the first detective stories, at least as we recognise them today, emerged in the early 1840s with the C. Auguste Dupin stories written by Edgar Allan Poe. And these introduce readers to the today rather cliched concept of an amateur detective who works to solve puzzling mysteries from the outside of the police, uh, often to the flabbergasted amazement 
of both detectives and characteristically stupid sidekick figures, and also the reader themselves. Fast forward sort of 20 years um, to the 1860s in the era of sensation fiction, characterised by writers like Wilkie Collins, Mary Elizabeth Braddon, or Ellen Wood, who was also known as Mrs. Henry Wood. And that's usually seen as the next milestone, if you like, in the genre's development, because these novels were centred on the discovery and subsequent revelation of nasty secrets like murder, bigamy, arson, theft. And these were usually contained within the sort of safe space or supposedly safe space of a bourgeois domestic atmosphere. Shoot forward another 20 years or so to 1887 uh, and the author detective, which m perhaps most famously represents um, Victorian detective fiction, appears. And that's Arthur Conan Doyle and uh, his detective Sherlock Holmes, who first appeared in A Study in Scarlet. Uh, and he's perhaps the most famous consulting detective of all. Um, this kind of typical textual triumvirate has come to characterise the evolution of crime fiction across the 19th and early 20th century for most. Um, studies in the chronology of the genre tend to use these three generic kind of moments as pillars within the narrative and then, and then place um, other less well-known authors or texts in and around them to build a more sophisticated yet still quite linear picture of the genre's evolution. And examples of these texts considered to be less important, uh, but obviously still worth examining, include the works of Emile Gaborio and his Monsieur Lecoq series from the 1860s, which is directly referenced uh, in the home stories, but which in Britain at least is often overshadowed by the exponential growth of the sensational press, or even perhaps texts like Fergus Hume's The Mystery of a Handsome Cab, uh, among others. But what this classic timeline sort of neglects to account for is the enormous melting pot of literary material that was flying around in the mid 19th century in the form of periodicals, magazines, newspapers, pamphlets, and other kind of printed ephemera. And what it also fails to look at is the steady evolution and spread of a uniformed, organised and professional police force in the UK, which actually coincided uh, with this evolution unbelievably closely as a result of the 1856 County and Borough Police Act, uh, which made uniform policing mandatory across the UK um, when it hadn't been before. And it also creates a kind of largely retrospective hierarchy of texts that have cultural value and importance placed on them by us with the benefit of hindsight. We decide which texts are most important to consider and which are not. And a lot of the time this process is kind of flawed. So the purpose of my wider research is to use these new aspects, periodicals and the police, which have gone and underexplored, I think, up to this point to add another layer to this generic timeline and to recharacterize it as a multifaceted evolutionary process that moves outwardly rather than chronologically. So in essence, my research argues that the periodical and magazine press had a constant and significant presence within the literary landscape of the 19th century, and that this helped to shape detective fiction into a genre in a much more dramatic way uh, than has previously been explored. And journalistic explorations of both crime and policing, which were largely separate for reasons I'll detail in a minute, helped to fill in some of those 20-year gaps um, in the stereotypical chronology of crime fiction that I've just described. So it's worth going over some, some of the history uh, of these forms of journalism. And for much of the early half of the 19th century, leading into the first part of the Victorian era in 1837, um, periodicals and newspapers were stifled uh, by the punitive, what was known as the taxes on knowledge. And these were a series of legislative motions put in place by central government to try and stifle the spread of public literacy, which they perceived as threatening. The abolition of these taxes, uh, which understandably had received quite a lot of public criticism over the near 150 year period that, that in which they were enforced, coincided almost exactly with the nationwide establishment of policing as a result of the 1856 County and Borough Police Act. So as a result, newly liberated periodicals began to quite happily write about subjects which had hitherto been suppressed. And one such subject was the socioeconomic and political implications of law enforcement. Police officers and uh, Officers, officers and leaders began to receive extensive criticism in the pages of mid-Victorian periodicals. And as uh, critic Stephen Koss argues, magazines and newspapers began to align themselves almost immediately along partisan divisions once the taxes were abolished. And this, two, this created two kind of main separate politicised narratives surrounding the police in periodical writing. Politically conservative magazines like this example from the Tory Quarterly Review in 1870 opted to support the police as middle class protectors uh, of, of uh, values like family, um, 
cap capital, uh, economics and commerce, you know, these kind of social structures they wanted to sort of maintain. And by contrast, socially liberal magazines remained quite suspicious of the police, arguing that they were expensive, uh, socially oppressive and quite militaristic in nature. And this example from the particularly vehement Saturday Review asked the question, where are the police? With the rhetorical answer, usually in the pub. And at this point, you might be wondering what all of this has to do with crime. But it's important to note that journalism that was interested in crime far predated that which was interested in the police which, as I've just said, only really became a thing around the mid-Victorian era. And as a result, crime journalism and police criticism remained almost completely separate from each other, uh, even after both had fully emerged. And that which looked at crime had another important role to play in the development of crime fiction. So crime journalism had a much, much, much earlier roots uh, than journalism uh, specifically targeted at criticising the police and stretched back to the mid-18th century, and in some cases even earlier. And it's thought that we can start to get a sense of the... Con Sorry, it's through this that we can start to get a sense of the connection between journalism uh, and crime fiction through this kind of lens of space and place, which I'll get to in a minute. And the, the 18th century and onwards saw the development and steady rise of, uh, in popularity of a number, number of different kinds of journalistic forms that were interested in reporting crime. And these included um, cheaply produced but wildly popular execution broadsides and pamphlets, and these were small. Um, sorry, there we go. These were small one-sheet publications which were peddled in the in crowd in in the crowds themselves at public executions and offered spectators valuable contextual information on the criminal that they were about to see executed. They often also contained um, a crude and generic kind of woodcut illustration um, of the execution taking place, uh, as you can see here, and also often published a few verses, apparently written by the criminal themselves, uh, expressing penitence and their desire for forgiveness for their crime. And these allowed witnesses to the execution to kind of actively participate in, uh, what was going on in a sort of pseudo voyeuristic way. And the critic Heather Worthington, uh, argues that these broadsides were sort of invasive because they augmented a a sort of invasion of the integrity of the body. Uh, and this idea of crime literature as pseudo voyeuristic is important and is the theme that I'll come back to uh, later on. And much of, but much of the information contained in your everyday execution broadside was at best very sensationalized and at worst simply fictional. And they were designed to encourage fear in readers and purported to demonstrate exactly what would happen to them if they were to break the law. And the fact that most of this material was perhaps slightly dubious didn't stop them being popular because they allowed spectators to identify more closely with the criminal and they allowed a sort of insider view into the lives, crimes, trials and punishments of offenders. And this public desire for more private information on criminals shown by the popularity of the execution broadside led the chaplains of prisons uh, to begin to um, publishing their own versions of broadsides. And, and the most widely remembered of these uh, were the ordinary of Newgate's accounts, which perhaps quite naturally had an edge over the execution broadside. The ordinary themselves had direct access to condemned criminals and could record and publish their last hours with a degree of legitimacy that broadsides simply couldn't match. And as a result, the accounts kind of became wildly popular uh, among readers of crime journalism simply for their insider information on the criminal's last hours in prison before their impending execution. And readers got an inside view of the prison itself as well as the events leading up to the execution without having to be in that nasty situation themselves. An example of this can be seen in The Ordinary's account here, which details the last hours of convicted murderess Elizabeth Brownrig in 1767. So it was perhaps only a matter of time um, before both the broadsides that we've seen first and the accounts we've seen second began to be collected together in a more concrete form of publication. Um, various accounts, stories and tales of criminal misdeeds from both execution broadsides and the ordinary accounts began to be collected together uh, and, were, and many were published under the now familiar name of the Newgate Calendar. We know that some of the calendars drew on earlier published forms of crime journalism uh, as some of the tales are almost verbatim um, such as this example here from the Newgate calendar, which is almost identical to that story, which was published uh, about Elizabeth Brownrigg uh, some 58 years before it. 
So these collections continued our trend, if you like, of, of helping our readers to get an inside view of criminality. But the scenes on display in these collections had a renewed focus on domesticity. So rather than looking inside the prison, we were looking at the domestic arrangements of the criminals themselves. And many of the narratives focused on the homes of criminals, where crimes of passion had often taken place, a bit like this one on my slide here. So now we're starting to get somewhere. Um, the ways in which these forms of crime journalism rounded up and retold incidents of crime with a view to helping readers see inside the criminal space, like a prison or an execution or a domestic scene of criminality, were replicated in the pages of magazines in the mid-Victorian era. So we start to see crime roundup features which were given titles like law and crime or criminal happenings or similar names, and they became common features in periodicals and magazines that sprang up uh, as a throughout the mid 19th century. Um, these were often culled from the Newgate calendar and other publications, but were also the direct result of journalistic endeavours to source criminal occurrences directly and then to report on them. And there are also aspects of these narratives in periodicals which were a direct result of their transposition over from other forms of media, which are important to point out. So the most important was that as periodicals and magazines were often tightly constrained by space requirements, crime roundups became largely formulaic. So they firstly recounted the life of the criminal, their upbringing and their professional situation before going on to discuss exactly how they fell into criminality and then a detail of their crime their arrest, their trial and their subsequent punishment. So they were limited to, quite, to a sort of life trial and execution sort of formula. And the second po point to note regarding the periodical based crime roundup uh, was that the police were quite absent from these. So that's what I said before about the, the crime narrative and the police uh, criticism remaining largely separate. Even in, after 1829, when the first Office of Uniform Police Officers was established in Westminster, the police didn't make much of an appearance in periodical-based crime journalism, and this life trial and execution formula, influenced by earlier crime narratives, meant that this form of journalism was already functional and had no need for the police officer or detective to track down the criminal. In fact, the fact that the criminal had already been tracked and apprehended and presumably punished was often the reason for the narrative's printing, so we didn't need to know how they were caught, we just knew that they were. So you might be wondering just where the detective starts to come into all of this. So what's detective fiction without a detective? And as I said before, the police received criticism in periodicals after the taxes on knowledge were repealed. So magazines were quickly split along partisan battle lines uh, over this issue. And the upshot of this was that people very quickly began to understand the political value and socioeconomic position of uniform policing and to understand what it was they were actually supposed to do and how they did it. So you might um, understandably assume that this newfound knowledge means that the police were inserted into crime journalism as the catalyst through which criminals uh, were actually apprehended. But as we've seen, this isn't the case because there was no room or purpose for the police officer to appear in any of these. Um, and as Stephen Knight kind of argued back in 1980, quite famously, throughout the 18th and early 19th century, society was kind of seen to ideologically police itself and crime journalism itself was a part of this. So rather than the police appearing in crime journalism, crime journalism sort of acted as a police officer, if you like, uh, in a very roundabout way on its own. So instead, the police began to be used in a kind of variety of other forms of journalism that are less formulaically entrenched. Um, and less ideologically constrained. And this is where our theme of space and place begins to show itself more clearly. So one sort of journalistic form that benefited from the newfound knowledge of the police, thanks to its periodical criticism, is that which I call social exploration journalism. And this was journalism written from the perspective of a journalist who went wandering around some of the seedy areas, areas of cities and into criminal spaces like prisons, police stations, crime scenes, uh, and reported back on his experiences to interested readers. And the idea here was for readers to actually experience the dangerous elements of the criminal underworld themselves without having to go and do it for themselves. So this, this form of journalism that had a focus, specific focus on criminality and was influenced by er, much, much earlier examples of this kind of writing. This includes Daniel Defoe's 1717, The History of the Press Yard. Um, of Newgate Prison, and then fast forward a century to 1821, and Pierce Egan's hugely popular serial text, Life in London, also includes a scene uh, which took place inside the walls of Newgate's press yard as the protagonists Corinthian Tom, Jerry Hawthorne and Bob Logic visit the prison just as a prisoner is being taken to the gallows, and this was illustrated by a young George Cruikshank, pictured on my slide here. <laughs> 
So social exploration journalism grew in popularity as the, as the periodical press grew. And the extensive criticism the police received meant that authors now realised that the police could help them uh, actually perform this kind of writing by accompanying them and protecting them directly uh, so they could delve deeper and deeper into criminal areas. So the mid-century saw numerous examples of this kind of writing um, appearing in periodicals uh, and, the, and the, the police officer or detective presence actually sort of seemed to become a prerequisite for journalists who wish to enter and explore and subsequently reveal criminal urban spaces uh, to readers. And examples of this can be seen in action here. Uh, but a good example to read out comes from the top right uh, example taken from the magazine Temple Bar in 1865. And in this, the journalist describes how his new exploits in social exploration have tended to be into criminal areas. Um, but he, crucially, he explicitly states he's never out of the company of a police officer for protection, obviously, but also for guidance. So I'm quoting from Stepney Police Station. Again, I have started always with the inspector to go the round of cheap gaffs, squalid saloons, small music halls, dancing taverns and concert rooms of the Ratcliffe Highway and Whitechapel, where the shottish is danced by foreign gentlemen and ladies habitually carry knives and occasionally use them. Perhaps the most famous example of this social exploration journalism appeared in the early 1850s with the publication of Charles Dickens's exploits alongside inspectors Field and Witcher. Um, Dickens didn't want so much to highlight the criminality of the city as, as he did highlight the kind of work that the police were doing uh, to actually protect the general population. But the form of writing itself is identical, <coughs> excuse me, to other examples of social, social exploration journalism that had a focus on criminality, which was designed to help readers understand what the criminal underworld of the city was like. Uh, so I'm quoting Dickens, St Giles's church strikes half past ten. We stoop low and creep down a precipitous flight of stairs into a dark, close cellar. There is a fire, there is a long deal table, there are benches. The cellar is full of company, chiefly uh, very young men in various conditions of dirt and raggedness. Some are eating supper, there are no girls or women present. Welcome to the Rat's Castle, gentlemen, and to this company of noted thieves. So progressing quite quickly from Dickens's non-fictional forays into crime and policing, we also get one of those senses that he was about to cross over into fiction in this sense too, as Inspector Field was very famously uh, the inspiration for the infamous Inspector Bucket in Dickens's novel Bleak House that appeared three years later. I'll talk a bit more about this uh, a bit later. But for now, it's important to note that the police officer or detective was viewed by mid-Victorian periodical journalists as a useful guide and protector into the criminal underworlds of inner city slums um, and that can help the reader to sort of experience them or this for themselves and get that, that pseudo voyeuristic uh, image of, of, of criminality that they were obviously historically so interested in. But we must move on. So this social exploration journalism allowed readers, along with journalists, to experience criminality in the same way that older forms of crime journalism had done. So the police officer found a sort of niche space carved out for him in social exploration journalism as a protector for the journalists and quickly became a sort of integral part of the narrative itself. But as Jessica Valdez points out, this kind of writing was often quite restrictive because having to maintain the truth within journalism or report on, on what actually happened uh, simply got in the way of authorial creativity. P nightly patrols were occasionally quite boring. Sometimes crimes didn't actually happen. Uh, and it was quite dangerous as well to actually accompany a police officer. So as a result, this form of journalism kind of quickly gave way uh, to more fictionalised renditions of itself. Um, this allowed for much more creative freedom than journalism, because the, but the position of the police officer as a useful guide and protector for journalists and readers had proven useful. So this gave rise to an extremely popular form of fiction, what I tend to call the police memoir, a form of writing that absorbed the idea that the police officer was a trustworthy guide into criminality, um, and then used that to basically took that and ran with it. So there's been a few isolated, there were a few isolated examples of that that appeared in the early 19th century, such as the diary of a barrister uh, during the last Wexford Assizes, uh, or the now relatively forgotten novel Richmond, uh, or scenes in the life of a Bow Street runner that appeared in 1827. But in the mid-Victorian era, the police memoir experienced a significant boom. The memoir style of writing itself was popular because it brought distant experiences closer to the reader. And as Heather Worthington again points out, they continued a trend of making public what had been private. 
And as she also suggests, they were one of the first fictional genres that place the figure of the police officer or detective at the centre of the narrative. And the illusion of truth was important to this genre. Police memoirs were marketed as the true accounts of police officers or detectives, usually those who'd been released from secrecy by leaving the force, usually through retirement. So they were sort of marketed as a way of um, the police officer saying, oh, I, I've had all these experiences and now I'm able to tell everything because I've left, whereas I was sworn to secrecy before. Um, they were cleverly constructed and because they were marketed as true this allowed them to sort of appeal to the same audiences as social exploration journalism that explored the criminal underworld but the fact that they were fictional meant that the author had creative freedom to write any kind of narrative that they wished and this combination made the police memoir very popular with mid-Victorian readers and the most prolific publisher uh, of police memoir fiction was the writer and journalist William Russell. Today he's either kind of completely forgotten or simply dismissed as a hack because his fiction was very formulaic, very cheap and designed largely to sell as many copies as possible. But I think just because his work wasn't particularly highbrow, which is true, it doesn't mean that it's not kind of worth critical attention. And Russell penned a huge number of police memoirs, including recollections of a police officer that appeared in Chambers Edinburgh Journal in 1849, which was republished as recollections of a detective police officer in 1856. A second series uh, of stories from this novel also followed in 1859. And his next text, Leaves from the Diary of a Law Clerk, appeared in 1857, and then Experiences of a Real Detective was published in the Sixpenny Magazine in 1862. And he also published the two-volume novel Autobiography of an English Detective in 1863, among numerous other texts. I can't list them all here, there's far too many of them. And police memoirs kind of appealed, or Russell's... Um, police memoirs particularly, appealed to the same audiences as those who were interested in social exploration, and they depicted police officers or detectives going about their duties, occupying criminal spaces and engaging with undesirable characters. And a scene from Recollections of a Police Officer can highlight this quite well, and reads very similarly to the Dickens piece uh, I mentioned before. So I'm quoting, we soon arrived before the door of a quiet, respectable looking house in one of the streets leading from the Strand. A low, peculiar knock given by Sanford was promptly answered. Then a password, uh, which I did not catch, was whispered by him through the keyhole and we passed in. We proceeded upstairs to the first floor, the shutters of which were carefully closed so that no intimation of what was going on could possibly reach the street. A roulette table and dice and cards were in full activity. Wine and liquors of all varieties were profusely berated. Play was proposed, and though at first stout stoutly refusing, I feigned to be gradually overcome by irresistible temptation, and I sat down to a blind hazard with my foreign friend for moderate stakes. I was graciously allowed to win, and in the end found myself richer in devil's money by about £10. So at this point, it's, just, it's especially important to point out um, that this form of writing was now contemporarily seen as, a, as the standard form of detective fiction, right? So we aren't... Um, we're far outside our narrative that we proposed at the beginning of the three um, Poe sensation fiction, Arthur Conan Doyle triumvirate. But this, this kind of genre at the time was seen as a standard form of detective fiction. A number of periodical commentators made this assertion, including Russell himself, who in 1862 argued that detective literature, if it may be so called, appears to have acquired a wide popularity, chiefly, I suppose, because the stories are believed to be in the main faithfully trolled, truthful narrative. So we've got the idea that detective fiction at this point simply was police memoir fiction and this and, and its purpose was to reveal uh, underlying criminality that existed within society for, for readers' amusement. So police memoirs, therefore, were influenced by a number of different forms of journalism, as we've already seen. Police criticism that helped people understand what the police do. Crime journalism that helped give rise to this idea that we're supposed to see inside the criminal underworld from a place of complete safety. And social exploration journalism that was the first incarnation of actually doing that. And it was also described contemporarily as detective fiction. And I think this has gone kind of relatively unexplored in that sort of canonical or stereotypical view of how the genre developed across the 19th century. And I think that it can therefore be inserted into our timeline that we looked at at the beginning uh, quite nicely as sort of stretching from around 1845 to around 1880. This is a sort of lifespan, if you like, and helps fill in that 40 year gap from between the last Edgar Allan Poe story and the appearance of Sherlock Holmes. Looking at this time here, timeline here, sorry, you can see how police memoir fiction uh, and another genre of fi fiction overlapped each other. Um, sensation fiction, a genre that's kind of characterised 
um, by the revelation of a bourgeois domestic scandal is often seen as a milestone in the development of crime and detective fiction. And I'd also like to suggest that it had quite a strong and unexplored connection with popular police memoirs through the exploration of private space. Um, excuse me again, which popular, uh, sorry, with popular police memoirs through that exploration of private space, which strengthens both genres positions within the development of detective fiction. And many examples of sensation novels like Charles Dickens's Bleak House, we've mentioned already, Mary Elizabeth Braddon's The Trail of the Serpent or Lady Audley's Secret, or even Wilkie Collins's famous The Moonstone, uh, include detectives who allow readers to access inaccessible private or criminal spaces in the exact same way uh, as police memoir fiction did. And some kind of mid-Victorian periodical commentators and journalists noticed this connection uh, between police memoir fiction and sensation fiction. So in June 1864, the Saturday Review uh, argued that detective literature formed one of the most common kinds of sensation writing. And in 1862, particularly, the London Review mentioned William Russell's character of Waters from recollections of a, de of a detective. Um, or recollections of a police officer, sorry, and suggested that sensation fiction was his direct evolution. Quote, it is now some years since the name of Waters became fam uh, first became familiar and welcome to readers in railway trains. In fact, it was discovered that a new vein of literature was opened up. The notebooks of barristers next supplied strange stories of crime and its detection, and the policeman line of writing was found to possess an interest often sadly wanting to more decorous publications. The multitude of novel writers had worn out every inconceivable theme when this welcome discovery was made. Accordingly, the criminal novel is now the mode. The crime is, of course, a mystery, and the plot is the statement of the means by which the mystery is detected. Mr Wilkie Collins was perhaps the first to adopt this fashion. So sensation fiction began to supersede police memoirs because authors of police memoir fiction essentially ran out of ideas. Um, and as a result, police memoirs began to move away from formulaic retellings of the police experience and broaden out into wider tales of scandal. But as sensation fiction seemed to have been kind of spawned by police memoirs, it continued using that police officer or detective figure as a guide, protector or invader of the criminal space. And as crit critic Anthea Trodd suggests, quote, the sensation novel was a literary institutionalisation of the habits of mind and of the new police force. Both the new genre and the new profession encouraged the construction of ingenious hypotheses about the private lives of others and treat as a game their private agonies. So sensation novels like the police memoir allowed readers to peek inside the private lives of others, using the police as a guide or a sort of literary lens to do so. And the use of police officers and detectives to invade the private space is evident in a large amount of sensation fiction, uh, where there are numerous examples of, of, of the police officers who use their authority to invade areas where they probably weren't welcome, all the while taking the reader along for the ride. So I'd like to spend a couple of minutes um, sort of talking, uh, detailing some examples of this in action um, with a, the detective sort of designed to reveal the private or, or take the reader along for the ride. So examples of this include Inspector Bucket from Charles Dickens's Bleak House, who physically moves in and out of both criminal and bourgeois domestic areas, particularly, uh, sorry, particularly memorable is a scene where Bucket whisks the novel's protagonist, Esther Summerson, away across London at night in pursuit of the missing lady deadlock. Uh, whom Bucket believes may be implicated in the murder of the solicitor, Mr. Tolkinghall. Esther manifests the reader in this scene um, and, Bucket, and describes Bucket's rather peculiar behaviour. And the following quote kind of accompanies this famous um, illustration by Fizz, uh, Hablo Knight Brown. Um, and one really does get the sense that Bucket owns the night. So, quote, we rattled with great rapidity through such a labyrinth of streets that I soon lost all idea where we were, except that we had crossed and recrossed the river and still seemed to be traversing uh, a low-lying waterside, dense neighbourhood of narrow thoroughfares, chequered by docks and basins, high piles of warehouses, swing bridges and masts of ships. At length, we stopped at the corner of a little slimy turning. After some conference, Mr. Bucket, whom everybody seemed to know and defer to, went in with the others at a door. And in a second example, Mary Elizabeth Braddon's Three Times Dead or The Secret of the Heath, which was republished as The Trail of the Serpent, includes a mute detective named Joseph Peters who uses his disability um, to blend into the crowd and to keep certain aspects of his profession to himself more, more effectively than his counterparts. And similarly to Bucket, Peters possesses the ability uh, to go wherever he pleases and the reader accompanies him 
as he goes. And a scene where, uh, sorry, which demonstrates this includes a moment where he overhears a private conversation in a public house between the novel's villain and his lover, which is quoted on the side here. And as an aside, I think it's quite interesting to note that in the in the first draft of, of um, The Trail of the Serpent or Three Times Dead, if whichever title you want to call it, Peters was actually called Waters uh, in a sort of either a coincidental or a rather overt reference to William Russell's recollections of a detective whose detective character was also called Waters. Um, sticking with Braddon, uh, in her famous novel Lady Audley's Secret um, from 1862, um, it is uh, the barrister Robert Audley who possesses uh, similar invasive abilities to Bucket and Peters. For example, when he enters Lady Audley's private dressing room through the use of a secret passage of which she's unaware, and the reader again accompanies the detective. Uh, quote, Robert Audley lifted a corner of the carpet and disclosed a rudely cut trapdoor in the oak flooring. George, submissively following his friend, found himself in five minutes standing amidst the elegant disorder of Lady Audley's dressing room. And again, the reader kind of invades this space uh, in the same way as Robert friend, Robert's friend George at the exact same time. And finally, uh, Wilkie Collins's The Moonstone is almost based almost entirely um, around uh, the concept of invading the, pri the private domestic bourgeois atmosphere and revealing it for the reader. Um, and the famous Sergeant Cuff, who is often lambasted for his failure to solve the mystery of the theft of the Moonstone itself, exists outside of established class, class structures. And the, f and the fact that he doesn't uh, make use of this to present the reader with a solution to the crime is what, leaves feel what often leaves readers feeling underwhelmed with his performance. But Cuff is actually responsible um, for revealing the novel's true secret. Um, it's not the theft of the diamond, as most readers suppose, but it is instead Godfrey Abelwhite's indebtedness and his attempted fencing of the diamond to pay off his debts. And Cuff's, Cuff proves Abelwhite to be the true criminal, fully exonerating Franklin Blake, who's suspected of the crime for most of the novel, specifically because of his existence outside of the family, and he can therefore help people to kind of see it more directly or more uh, externally, I suppose. So, the mid-Victorian landscape um, of detective fiction then relied on authors and readers placing um, absolute trust in police officers and detectives, and that's something that we've not really mentioned yet. So we've got the landscape of detective fiction kind of based on the idea that the police officer is a trustworthy guide into the criminal, either in the police memoir, which takes people into the underworld of, of, of the city, or in sensation fiction, where we often see insights into the bourgeois domestic space. But this, this kind of relied on trust in the police and detective officers and law enforcement in general to act as trustworthy guides and protectors and informants into criminal spaces. However, as the era entered the 1870s, public estimation of the police force began to seriously decline. And as Charles Rosepka argues here, the Clerkenwell prison bombings, the Hyde Park riots of uh, both in 1867, started to turn public opinion against the police. And in 1877, it reached perhaps its lowest point. Four detective inspectors named Michael John Druskovich, Palmer and Clark were arrested and accused of corruption. And the case was widely reported uh, in periodicals. And as a result of a lengthy inquiry at Bow Street um, a, and a highly publicised trial at the Old Bailey, um, three of the of the inspectors were convicted and sentenced to two years imprisonment with hard labour. Clark, the fourth, was acquitted. And the scandal itself kind of received a vitriolic reaction in the mass media and plunged a spear of distrust through the heart of the detective system. Nobody trusted detectives anymore. And as we can see on these slides here, the reaction um, against detectives was, was pretty spectacular. And things were only to get worse uh, as the 1880s progressed. Um, the 1877 corruption scandal kind of refused to go away, um, even after it was done in periodical commentary, and a series of kind of other events made things a lot more complicated for the police. A sustained bombing campaign from Irish nationalists rocks, rocked the country, and consequently the mass media, and in 1888, of course, the Whitechapel murders committed by Jack the Ripper placed law enforcement squarely back into the public spotlight. And the incompetence of the police at preventing these so-called outrages um, meant that towards the end of the 19th century their public image was severely damaged. And this had a corresponding impact um, of how on how the, on the way sorry that police officers or detectives could be used in fiction and as I said before the entire 19th century before these events had been characterized by a relationship of trust um, 
existing between the journalist, author, reader and police officer to create the literary forms that have become known as detective fiction. But this trust can no longer be sustained because police officers were now seen, at least to some extent, to be part of the criminal underworld. Um, and uh, that they'd, uh, well, to be a part, sorry, of the criminal underworld that they previously allowed people to be access, uh, allowed people access to. So in periodical based fiction, there were kind of two observable reactions. There was firstly a sort of sharp increase, if you like, um, in the depictions of idiotic, incompetent, corrupt, or just plain useless police officers in late Victorian periodical fiction. And the police officer became a kind of bumbling figure uh, in this kind of writing, particularly in satirical renditions of the police. And this becomes quite important later when we start to think about the figure of Inspector Lestrade from the Sherlock Holmes stories, or even the kind of still um, culturally present perspective of the official police officer in, in comparison to the, the, the brilliant detective in detective fiction. And the second kind of natural reaction of authors was to turn away from using official police detectives as protagonists and turn more towards using the private detective. So, excuse me, a palpable explosion of, of private detectives appeared in periodical fiction in the wake of the 1877 scandal and the subsequent journalistic campaign against the police in the wake of the various other scandals that engulfed the police. But there are a number of benefits to using private detectives instead of official. Uh, police detectives, which a number of authors made use of, including Arthur Conan Doyle. Private detectives were much freer to pick and choose the cases they undertook and were not bound as official police officers were to investigate everything that came through the door. And this allowed authors to create much more interesting or perhaps slightly sensationalised cases for their detectives to try and solve. And it allowed for a much higher success rate as well because detectives could pick things that they only thought they could actually solve. Um, I mean, think about the first kind of short story of, of uh, Sherlock Holmes, where the first case comes from the King of Bohemia who walks through the door. Uh, it's not exactly something you'd get reporting at Stepney Police Station or somewhere like that. And secondly, private detectives were able to use their discretion when it came to punishing offenders they'd actually caught, allowing for a much stronger ideological message to be portrayed in the narratives. If a detective felt that an, an offender had acted morally correctly, even though they'd broken the law, they could always choose to let them go. And thirdly, using private detectives actually allowed some authors to present further criticism of the police, quite naturally, as some private detectives uh, were depicted as successfully solved in cases where other official detectives had failed. Um, so we should think about all of these points when we consider Sherlock Holmes, which we're now going to do. So at long last, we can finally start talking about Sherlock Holmes uh, directly as the kind of final point of my talk today. So Holmes kind of immediately seems to be a manifestation of everything that we've kind of talked about when we um, discuss the rise of private detectives. And in some ways he kind of is. He's a private detective. He works Sorry, he's a private detective who works on cases that he picks and chooses at his own will. And in some cases, um, allows offenders to go free, even when they've committed a crime, um, simply because he understands that not all criminals are bad people, even though they've broken the law, or that sometimes they act wrongly, but for the right reasons. But it is slightly more complicated than this, too. Holmes is contemporary. Uh, Lestrade is presented as a slightly bumbling detective, as we might expect, but not in quite as vitriolic a way as we might think. And this is because I think the Strand magazine itself, where, where the Holmes short stories were published, was an effort to present a sort of comfortable backdrop against which to set fiction and to offer kind of previously debunked social institutions a route back into acceptance in wider society. And George Nunes, who was the, pub the original editor and proprietor of the Strand, felt that his magazine was more designed to entertain and to present kind of uh, light entertainment, if you like, than to present highly charged political commentary. And the figure of Lestrade is truly interesting because the police are obviously a very politicised institution at this point, generating a lot of political opinions. And George Nunes and, and Arthur Conan Doyle sort of diminish that very slightly. He kind of represents, I think, the Strand's um, desire to present a kind of easy social backdrop against which to set literary characters. Uh, but obviously, the magazine couldn't escape the poor perception of detectives. Uh, and and that kind of gives us that slightly bumbling, slightly incompetent, but largely harmless figure of Lestrade. And we can also see finally in, in terms of space and place, a sort of return to that protective aspect of the detective as able to penetrate the most dangerous or inaccessible locations. Uh, Sherlock Holmes in The Man with the Twisted Lip is, is first seen in a rather nasty opium den 
blending in with the denizens as easily as you might please. And this is setting up a Swandham Lane, which doesn't actually exist and is modelled on uh, Swan Lane in London, which does. There's nothing to see there anymore. But in 19th, in, the, in 19th century London, Swan Lane was a riverside full of gin shops and other crime dens. Uh, today, it's just the rear of an office building, but it is set uh, in, in the real world, if you like. Um, but the nefarious atmosphere of this area of London portrays Holmes's connection with, the gro with growing an social anxiety, this growth of the urban, commuter-oriented cityscape. In the late 19th century, the literary focus was on short fiction, including kind of the bite-sized Sherlock Holmes short stories, and the kind of high Victorian triple-decker three-volume beast of a novel uh, had kind of fallen by the wayside. Um, and this was because, among other things, more people were commuting on rapidly expanding mass transit systems. More people were uh, using underground and overground trains at that point. And the city sort of grew exponentially and created a new network uh, of, of derelict and dangerous areas that were kind of high, high for criminal activity. And additionally, the 1870 Education Act, which had made child education compulsory, significantly increased literacy rates. And the first generation to benefit from the 1870 Education Act were that those, sorry, of the late 1880s and, and 1890s, when those children were maturing to a point where they can read uh, sort of quicker fiction um, and consume it much more easily um, at that point. So as a result, then, the Sherlock Holmes stories kind of manifest a reaction um, to a number of conflicting social anxieties and changes that were going on in the, the 1880s and 90s. The relationship between Holmes and Lestrade kind of characterises that tension uh, between the public and the police in the wake of the 1877 scandal and the Whitechapel murders, as well as how these events were reported in periodicals. And the way that Holmes interacts with criminal spaces helps to show how a detective character is still needed for readers to accompany, or for Watson to accompany, into urban slums. And the way the characters move around using cabs and trains, etc., demonstrates both the excitement and the anxiety surrounding the growing uh, urban city that's so fast and so difficult to navigate. Even the format of the stories themselves, short, bite-sized chunks that can be read in isolation without having to worry about reading that which came before it or that which comes after it for the sake of continuity, portrays the fact that life in the city was simply getting faster. In fact, if we look at the iconic cover of the Strand magazine, it kind of depicts the city itself, which we can see there. So that's that's kind of where we get to, and that's kind of the, the sort of connection uh, between um, journalism, older journalism, 18th century, 19th, early 19th century journalism, police journalism, social exploration journalism, how all of those things kind of blended together to kind of create that landscape where Sherlock Holmes manifests kind of all of those things, the way, to, the way of exploring the city uh, to protect the reader, the kind of effectiveness over the police detective who's sort of fallen by the wayside. And I hope I've kind of managed to get across that there are a huge number of connections between newspaper and periodical journalism, the idea of space and place and sort of invading that for the benefit of the reader and the development of crime and detective fiction. And to kind of sum it all up, the mid-Victorian era was in, in some ways kind of broadly influenced by that melting pot of journalism that kind of came out of the earlier 18th century and the advent of policing and their use in social exploration journalism made the police and detectives excellent guides or protectors for readers but this relationship was based on trust trust which was then shattered towards the end of the 19th century and this created i think the perfect literary landscape for the rise of the private detective the figure of sherlock holmes and naturally driven by george Nunes's uncanny perception for what the public wanted in their fiction. So thank you very much for listening and I'm looking forward to answering some questions. Thank you very much. I shall stop sharing my screen. Oh, well, it was such an interesting lecture, sir. Thank you so much for that. And uh, thank you. I just want to uh, uh, extract more information regarding one of the ideas that you just uh, presented here. Uh, I just wondered uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the repeated use of uh, writers uh, dealing with private detectives in, in, instead of uh, official uh, authorities. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Uh, why do they often do that? And you just told that uh, they use it as a tool to uh, make a criticism on the officials. Uh, but uh, how far does it justify when you consider all the societies of the world? And this has been happening for uh, uh, quite some time, uh, even from the advent of uh, Sherlock Holmes. So how far can we justify that uh, particular aspect? It's interesting you ask that, actually. I mean, when you think about the development of crime fiction into the 20th century, 
and think about what we call the the sort of golden age of crime fiction. And when when we say golden age novels, we think Agatha Christie, we think Dorothy L. Sayers, uh, and authors like that. You know, characters like Hercule Poirot and and um, Miss Marple. These are figures who operate kind of outside the boundaries of official law enforcement structures. But the um, the kind of presence of the police is sort of very quickly re-established as something that is necessary, um, but something that is undesirable. Um, so I think what authors are having to do, and even today we're still having to kind of look at it um, very carefully, is not to suggest that we don't want the police around, but more to suggest that the private detective is somehow a more kind of useful figure to use in fiction simply because they're much more easily um, placed in awkward situations. They're not kind of bound by ideological uh, constrictions or even actual constrictions in terms of rules and laws. You know, pri private detectives can do a lot more. Um, so it's not, we're having to kind of trade off that, do I want to have someone who's got that kind of power of the law behind them? Or do I want to have someone who can take the law into their own hands, but always kind of constantly has to have a moral compass from which to act? Because otherwise, if you don't have that and you're willing to take the law into your own hands, then you start getting into Moriarty territory. And that's obviously he's he's someone who takes the law into his own hands, but doesn't have that kind of kind of guiding moral aspect to him and just kind of does what he wants. So really, the, the, the way we justify it, as you put it, is to create your character, if you like, I think. Um, with both of those things. And that's why Moriarty and Holmes are so well uh, opposed to each other in that kind of narrative dichotomy, because they are a very similar character, but just one has that moral element to him and the other doesn't. Uh, and that's what makes them, what makes Moriarty so scary, I think. So in, in the context of, the, of, of, of the, the kind of history of crime fiction, even today, you, you sort of see um, series, if you like, of, of crime fiction novels or, or any kind of crime fiction it doesn't really matter where, where the character has a connection to official law enforcement, but doesn't fully engage with it simply because they're a lot more uh, creatively free, I think. Um, and that's how we kind of justify it. We don't, it's not that we don't want the police. It's more that this is more useful and much more uh, creative for me to develop a new narrative. Right, sir. <clears throat> and again, uh, treading on the same topic and uh, I just want to move further that, uh, the, uh, when we take that particular character, the detective, he mm. will pr probably be the protagonist of the entire narrative. And uh, <clears throat> in the past, I have just read uh, uh, Dennis Lahane's novel, and I hope uh, everyone would have known about Dennis Lahane. I think uh, he's uh, one of the uh, last uh, successors of this great tradition of uh, writing about uh, detectives. And uh, in his uh, particular uh, uh, list of novels, we see the protagonist being uh, uh, having uh, uh, coming from uh, uh, being clothed from the same trope. I mean, uh, he would have had a traumatic past. Uh, he would have been in, as a part of the department of the force, uh, or he would have gotten fire, fired, or uh, he would have lost a loved one. And uh, this traumatic experiences. Uh, <clears throat> make him a person whom uh, other people can depend upon. He wants to serve others, he wants to uh, 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 avoid the tragedy that could occur to other people. And how do you see this particular uh, trope or how do you see this uh, stereotypical characterization? I think um, it's quite interesting you, you kind of bring up that troubled past element of the detective. There is real mileage if you like, it, for someone to perform more research into um, the traumatized cerebral detective, if you like, who um, has some kind of connection, as you say, to official law, law enforcement, but has had some kind of experience that's isolated them from it. Um, I see that as, as a very common characteristic in crime fiction, but one that we don't often pay that much attention to, um, which is quite interesting, really. So, giving um, your character a connection to the police that no longer exists means that they can operate within the same kind of structures. They can maintain connections. They can maintain um, contact, if you like, and networks from which to draw information. They're kind of privileged, I suppose, if you think about it in those terms, you know, they're able to operate within the same kind of frameworks as the police that has all those resources at their disposal. But at the same time, again, they're not constricted. Uh, by the li limitations of actually working for the official police. And, and to sort of give your character a, a level of trauma is a much more common 
a trope that appears in more recent fiction, I think, because we need our detectives to be isolated. We need them to work alone or in a small partnership. We need them to be able to think uh, and operate without any kind of um, familial or familiarity connection connection with anyone who would then become a liability to them. And that's becoming a trope as well. Um, so oddly enough, it's something I'm looking at a little bit more um, in depth, I suppose, as, as sort of part of a future project that uh, I've kind of got in the back of my head right now. And it's, it's really interesting that you bring it up because what I want to do is sort of give this idea of the sort of lonely and or damaged and or uh, somehow um, isolated detective figure some more kind of critical focus if you like in future research because i've kind of already done some work on this kind of super able detective there's a, this, the detective figure always has some kind of cerebral ability or um characteristic that separates them largely from everybody else in the narrative so sherlock holmes has his um you know supreme reasoning ability uh poirot has is kind of othered by his nationality in the context of most of the novels that he in which he appears so he's the only kind of um belgian in a society of very british people and that sort of professionally isolates him um lord peter whimsy who is uh, dorothy l sayers uh, detective protagonist is an aristocrat and is therefore usually seen as sort of elevated and yet somehow distinguished uh, from someone else and then and we get this kind of sense that detectives in even in more recent fiction are um, isolated by some kind of defining characteristic that others see first. Um, I'm trying to think of um, a detective that I can use. Um, so uh, J.K. Rowling's no Robert Galbraith novels um, with Cormoran Strike, you know, he's, sort of, he's, he's an amputee and he's an ex kind of war veteran and people tend to see that first. Um, so there's always some kind of veneer uh, that we see the detective first and then, and then they can kind of operate behind that. Uh, and, and it kind of reduced everybody else's expectations. But this idea that the detective must constantly be lonely is something I'm quite interested in pursuing a bit further. And your, your kind of point about det detective being damaged uh, is really interesting because they are always damaged by something. We're not quite sure what it is. Uh, I mean, I'm thinking of even Dexter's Inspector Morse. You know, he's really damaged. He's very sort of lonely and isolated. And, and um, I'm, I'm kind of curious as to why that has to be the case. Um, P Peter Whimsy himself suffers from from post-traumatic stress disorder from the First World War. You know, there's always something that's, that's sort of isolating for the detective and, and stops them from being able to forge relationships that would otherwise be um, a, a, a weakness, if you like. And it's a very kind of cruel way of putting it, but it's, it's more reliability, if you see what I mean, that we have to kind of get over. But I think it's, there's a very cruel way to do it. And, and there's sort of a s very nasty streak running through some crime fiction, I think, sometimes that, that causes us to really hurt our detective characters and when i and i want to kind of say no we should probably stop doing this it's a little cruel um but yeah i hope that answers your, your question oh wonderful sir i think uh, this has served the <clears throat> ultimate purpose of why we conduct uh, this particular uh, segment called expert library because we get to interact with the uh, subject experts from all over the world uh, we get to uh, have an insight about their research work <clears throat> and uh, uh, just like me, our audience are also curious to ask you some questions and I would like to offer the chat to Mr. Karthikeyan, who is a, who's also a content developer at uh, Literia. Thank you, Prem. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Samuel Sanders, for that wonderful lecture. Well, and you took us through the entire history of detective and crime fiction by talking about the origin and the development of the genre in fiction. And we had a wonderful time listening to your, uh, to your uh, thought-provoking talk. Yeah. Uh, let us move on to the Q&A session. This yep. question comes from one of our YouTube audience. Uh, he goes by the name of Raj and he asks, Police procedural TV shows have been popular for decades. Do they have their roots in detective fiction? Yes, absolutely. Um, the police procedural is a kind of subgenre. I don't. I, I tend to over categorize things. I like things to be placed in categories or taxonomies, the way you can see connections between the two. And I, I try and avoid that um, as much as I can. But it is a kind of natural instinct. So I will say the police procedural is a sort of subgenre, if you like, of crime fiction, um, and it is a more um, formulaic way of presenting detective fiction in this way uh, that has its appeal, I think, in the safety um, and the security of the knowledge that we know the solution to the mystery is going to be solved by the end of the, of the, 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 
the show. And there is a real kind of tension, if you like, uh, that exists in crime fiction between um, it's kind of the words overused, but it's cozy kind of aspects. If you like, you know, we like, we feel comforted. We feel safe even when we're watching crime fiction. Um, but at the same time, they deal with very horrible things, you know, death and murder and, uh, and, 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 all, all sorts of horrible things that go on in, in crime fiction. I'm not going to sort of start listing off crimes, but the police procedural is a really interesting one because it kind of showcases that tension between horror and, and comfort. You know, we are watching something really nasty unfold on the screen in front of us, but we feel quite safe in the knowledge that it's going to be solved uh, by the end of it. Uh, and it's, it's a way of beginning to kind of redress, if you like, that trust in the police that, that was so damaged, particularly in the UK, at least, uh, towards the end of the 19th century, this kind of lent this, this, um, idea to us that the police are somehow bumbling and we need someone much more better or much more effective to do the, do their job for them. The police procedure is a sort of reaction to that and to say, no, actually there are police officers out there who can do this and we have got structures in place that work and we have got procedures that, that can actually effectively solve crimes. And when we watch a police procedural, we, we kind of get a sense of uh, how it actually works around us. And again, this goes back to what I was saying before about how we like to see inside the world of criminality from a place of complete, a place of complete safety. Um, you know, we get to watch the police in action. We get to see their structure. We get to see inside the police station. We get to see their processes, uh, the interviews with pathologists. We get to see the forensic examinations, all the processes they've got that make us feel, yes, there is some kind of social structure in place uh, that can protect us from latent criminality that we know also exists. And when we see the police on the street, we don't really know what they're doing. So a way of watching them in a fictional sense gives context to the everyday experience that we have when we see the police out there. Um, and so I think that the police procedural is a really interesting kind of subgenre that doesn't get enough attention because it's kind of dismissed a lot of the time as formulaic and cozy and easy watching. There's loads of them in the UK. I can think of several off the top of my head that are uh, really kind of procedurally driven. And yet they attract huge audiences. We love to watch the police do their job uh, and they definitely have roots. Um, and, uh, and connections to, to earlier forms of crime fiction that rejected the police or at least kind of sidelined them to, to sort of react to that and say, no, actually, there is a way of getting the police into crime fiction uh, and, 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 and watching what they do and, and trusting them again. And I think also the, the kind of other that's interesting point about that is that, well, we've, we were just mentioning a second ago that kind of lonely, isolated, damaged, cerebral, intellectual detective on the private side. The police procedure kind of allows groups of people to solve things together. Uh, so if we think about things like, um, I don't know if anyone will have watched it, but the, you know, all the CSI kind of shows, or we've got Silent Witness, or we've got even really sort of um, easy watching ones. Like in, in Britain, there's a show called New Tricks, which is a lot of um, sort of retired detectives who are brought back in to, to solve crimes. And it's, it's, it's almost a comedy, you know, it's, it's hilarious. Uh, but it's a way of showcasing saying, no, our detectives don't have to be damaged and isolated and, and on their own. They can work as a team. They can forge connections with other people and, and, and work together. It's not necessarily as isolating as, as we think. And there is a sort of like tension, if you like, between those two things that I think they sort of fit into quite well. Yeah. From your answer, I also came to uh, I came to this idea recently. Have you seen the recent adaptation of Sherlock on BBC, uh, Dr. Samuel Saunders? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen that. Yeah. Uh, does it not seem more like a police procedural show than a, a straight adaptation of uh, Conor Doyle's works? Yeah, it definitely borrows some elements of proce police procedurals. I think um, the, the the kind of process of moving from. Um, a kind of narrative textual form into a televised form, particularly for a, for a sort of early 21st century uh, audience, it means that it kind of has to imbibe, um, I think, a lot of kind of tropes that would kind of cause it to be recognisable as what we've, what we've seen before. Um, but I think it does it really well. Uh, and I think it, it showcases um, that distinction between how the police operate kind of within their rigid kind of structure. It's not necessarily rigid, but it's at least the process that they have to kind of follow. And um, the freedom, the creative kind of freedom of the private detective to say, I've got this hunch and I'm going to follow it and I don't care what you say uh, type thing. So we kind of need that police procedural element against which to offset the private detective's methodologies. You know, we have to have this process in place to say, this is how the police are going to do it. And look at our private detective who's a law unto themselves and, uh, and they're going to do everything against that and end up with the right result anyway. Um, so, yeah, that absolutely it borrows. Um, from 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 that kind of TV, but at the same time, I think it's necessary for it to work um, as effectively as it does. So the audiences uh, 
change in taste, particularly when it comes to their uh, uh, entertainment value. Because nowadays, uh, people are looking for instant gratification. Maybe that's the reason why Sherlock has been adapted as a police procedure. Okay, let's, let's move on to the next question from our YouTube audience. Uh, this question comes from uh, uh, Shankar, and uh, he asks, Have you read James Hardley Chase's Tiger by the Tail? How do you rank him among the greats such as Poe, Doyle, and Christie? No, okay. Sadly, I've not read that one. Um, I, I'll I've read it once oh, again. Okay. The question goes, have you read James Hardy Chase's Tiger by the Tail? Mm -hmm. How do you rank him among the greats such as Poe, Doyle, and Christie? It's not one I'm familiar with, sadly. Um, I've got, a, a, see behind me, I have a, an enormous reading list of books, um, but I'm going to, to write that one down. Tiger by the Tail. It seems to be the name of a novel written by yeah, I'll, uh, James I'll have, James. I shall have a look at that one. It's not one I've, I'm familiar with, sadly. Um, but uh, I will definitely look into it. I'm always happy to receive recommendations for new crime fiction. I think that's kind of the, the joy of the genre. It doesn't matter how many crimes we see solved or whether it's the same crime over and over again. We don't really mind um, reading more and more and more. <laughs> okay, sir. Let us move on to the next question. This question comes from uh, Priya Darshini. She asks, what mental disorder did Sherlock Holmes have? Yeah, yeah, mm, mm. Um, it's um, it's a difficult question to answer because in the original kind of stories, it's not kind of openly referenced um, that he has any kind of mental disorder whatsoever. I mean, even kind of the term disorder implies some kind of um, damage, if you like, or illness almost and and that a lot of people kind of respond to that and say well it's not really an illness it's more just kind of a, a different way of being wired um there are numerous kind of um claims if you like that sherlock holmes is um placed on the autism spectrum on some in some regard there are also the arguments that i kind of subscribe to personally are that those readings are problematic in some way because um, they are always ascribed by someone who's looking at Sherlock Holmes. And I've written some stuff on this um, already, which is open access if anyone wants to read it, which I'm not going to use as a sort of plug thing, but the, I'm going to kind of quote from, from my own kind of writing here. Those, those kind of externally ascribed views of Sherlock Holmes tend to place diagnoses on him um, from an, from an external perspective. And we're not, it, it's not enough for us to be able to do that, to sort of look at a character and say, um, they're somehow neuroatypical. We don't like, um, how he operates. We don't understand the way he thinks and therefore there's something wrong with him. That doesn't necessarily mean that's true. Um, the, and these diagnoses often come from, um, kind of stereotypical or very typical characters who don't think on the same level. Um, so this is a kind of symptom of what I was saying before about how the um, detective is always kind of isolated by a defining characteristic. Um, and, and because other characters are looking at Sherlock Holmes and they're saying you are you have some kind of um, disorder, as you put it, um, that you must be different from me and you must be different from everybody else. Um, so, and no one really can sort of pin down what it is that, 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 that Sherlock Holmes has that's, as, as we would put it, wrong with him. Um, it's, uh, the idea, I think, is more um, to sort of just say there is something different about Sherlock Holmes and that that's necessary for him to function as a character. Um, so we don't, kind of, I, we don't know, essentially, is the answer to that question, what's wrong with Sherlock Holmes. Um, but I think really that the actual answer to the question is that there is nothing wrong with Sherlock Holmes. It's just the way we look at it. Um, and we need that kind of distinction in order to isolate him effectively so that he can do his job. Um, and, and those readings are often unfair, I think, of, of Sherlock Holmes as a character with, with some kind of uh, issue um, that allows him to function on a kind of different level to everybody else. He kind of necessarily has to function on that kind of level in order for him to be a decent detective. Um, and we should kind of celebrate that, I think. Um, but there's no kind of diagnosis out there uh, to say this is what's, what Sherlock Holmes has got. No. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, sir. And uh, next question comes from uh, Balakumar Palsami. And he asks, is Sherlock Holmes the most 
filmed fictional character. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. I don't know. There are so many adaptations uh, of Sherlock Holmes. There are so many um, renditions of him on screen. Um, the interesting figure I actually have in mind is is the um, the Basil Rathbone adaptations with um, Nigel Bruce's Watson, who gives us this kind of sense that Watson is um, a bumbling, kind of ineffective, rather portly, um, unsure figure who do, who sort of wanders along and is constantly in in awe of Sherlock Holmes's amazing ability. And really, like when we actually think about it, Watson is not um, the kind of like ineffective bumbling sidekick figure who just basically comes along for the ride and is there simply just to accentuate Holmes's abilities simply by being flabbergasted all the time. He's more of a, he's, you know, he's a, he's a medical doctor, you know, he's an intelligent guy uh, and he writes all the stories, you know, let's, let's not beat around the bush here. Watson isn't stupid. Um, and it's really like the, the interesting kind of point about that question is, is simply how adaptation of, of the stories can really change our perceptions of the character quite fundamentally you know we have this sort of view of watson as a character that doesn't come from the home stories itself it comes from a sort of adaptation of those stories that have really regained popularity in our in our cultural consciousness and um it's very possible that holmes is one of the most filmed uh characters i couldn't count how many times he's appeared on screen if you're looking for a particular favorite of mine i have a real sort of soft spot for the disney mouse uh, adaptation <laughs> of the great mouse detective i think it's brilliant um but uh it's it's absolutely possible but the the point about adaptation and the way that it, and, and the way that it can help shape our view of the character is absolutely true and um a lot, a lot of people will like now sort of associate benedict cumberbatch with Sherlock holmes um and uh it's um very curious how that process works thank you sir thank you for answering this question and uh, our next question comes from uh, and he asks, what is Edgar Allan Poe's unique contribution to detective fiction? Um, I have a bit of a soft spot for Edgar Allan Poe's original Dupin short stories. I mean, he is credited. It's, it, it's obviously a very difficult, um, murky past that we look into. Um, but he's kind of credited with creating the kind of armchair detective who solves cases from the comfort of their own home using nothing but their mind um, and by observations. You know, he's sort of able to look at sources. He's able to look at pieces of evidence in front of him or the actions of people around him um, or the uh, way that things are arranged in a room and to sort of draw inferences from that. So he, he, he kind of comes up with this term for it called ratiocination, which is a, essentially a process of reasoning. Um, so where we'll see... Um, this this has been left on the table. That means they were doing this before that, which means obviously gone here. That means they've done that. It's a way of sort of coming up with a, pro a logical process of reasoning to say this 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 process uh, contributes to this one, to this one, to this one, to this one, and then to draw a conclusion from it from the end. And 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 Dupin is the kind of first character we see uh, who actively performs this process consciously. Now there are other characters from from earlier pieces of fiction that do a similar kind of process from some, some uh, late 18th century Gothic fiction. And, and there are characters who perform a kind of process of reasoning to draw a conclusion. There are also kind of moments where um, characters will detect, if you like, so they, there is a problem and they have to kind of reason out a solution. Um, and those, those are often credited, if you like, with, with being the earliest incarnations of crime fiction that predate Edgar Allan Poe. And I, I kind of 100% get on board with a lot of these. There are, there are examples of crime fiction that existed before Edgar Allan Poe's stories, 100%. And also, as I've kind of argued uh, extensively elsewhere, um, it's not just in fiction that we need to see the origins of crime fiction. That was kind of the point of my, uh, my, my lecture today. But Poe is kind of credited with inventing, if you like, the conscious awareness of this process, if you like. Uh, and I have yet to see an example of that that comes from an earlier point where the character sits down and says, this is how I solve things and this is the process and this is what it's called. And, and, and to kind of invent that um, narrative dichotomy between the detective and the psychic. So in the post stories, we've got this unnamed narrator who simply exists to tell the story and to kind of highlight Dupin's prowess, if you like, as a detective and say, look how amazing this process is. Um, and how wonderful it is and how and, and, and how it can help us to solve crimes. And, and Poe himself is obviously very consciously trying to use this in the real world. Um, so in his second um, Dupin story, The Mystery of Marie Roget, it's based on 
it's sort of an attempt, if you like, to present a potential solution using Dupin's process of ratiocination to solve an actual crime, the murder of Mary Rogers in New York uh, in the early 1840s. And so he's obviously thinking this is a, a, a methodology of crime solving that we can actively use in the real world. I think the slightly cynical part of me is sort of saying, yeah, and he was trying to sell books at the same time, which he probably was, uh, to be quite honest with you. But at the same time, he's also thinking this is a new conscious thing that we can then sort of implement. And uh, to sort of we, he is credited with creating that kind of inductive reasoning process and also the, the sort of detective sidekick dichotomy that we then see in action again in later incarnations of crime fiction. So he's, his, his contribution to the, the kind of detective fiction genre is, is definitely there. Um, there's, there's a lot more to it, as, as lots of us are always pointing out, but he's, he's kind of credited with being that sort of genesis moment. Uh, absolutely. Thank you, sir. And from what you said earlier, I have uh, this one question for you, sir. You said that uh, Dupont uh, has this unnamed narrator who talks about how the detective solves these uh, crimes and what ways he utilizes. Can we say that Watson also say, that plays the same role uh, in Sherlock Holmes' stories where he is the narrator and from his point of view we are seeing the crime being solved and even Sherlock Holmes uh, talks to Watson when he says I did this, I did that, I saw this clue and uh, uh, from what we have been saying earlier, can we come to the conclusion that Watson also plays a, a, you know, an important role in uh, Sherlock Holmes' discovery of crimes? Absolutely. I mean, um, Watson's got a sort of pivotal role um, in the Sherlock Holmes stories. There's, there's kind of a lot of facets to your question that, that I, could, I could spend all day talking about this. But um, Watson himself performs a similar function to the narrator, um, so much to the point where in the... Um, earliest Sherlock Holmes stories, um, I think it is in A Study in Scarlet, um, Watson kind of openly asks Holmes whether it's kind of like he operates on a similar level to Dupin um, and sort of forges that open and conscious connection between himself, Holmes and, and Dupin. And, and Holmes kind of responds with a sort of tongue in cheek, Dupin was a miserable bungler. You know, he doesn't like Dupin. And there's a real sort of like... Um, I'm disassociating myself from that, but obviously Doyle is saying I'm very aware uh, of this ha this kind of narrative history as well. You could definitely say that um, the unnamed narrator and Watson share characteristics. You know, they are there to tell the story. They are there to to kind of present our view of of Holmes himself. And this goes back to the earlier question about um, Holmes's. Um, neurotypicality in some way you know our, not only do other characters ascribe diagnoses to him but so do we because our external view of Holmes is kind of filtered through Watson's voice so the only the only view we get of Sherlock Holmes is Watson's we don't see him at all um of a, in our own way we can't draw our own influence inferences about Holmes we, ha we have to see it through Watson's perspective and the same is true for Dupin you know the narrator kind of exists to provide our view uh, of, of, of um, Dupin himself and so they perform similar functions, but I think um, Doyle is kind of more conscious of the character and fleshes out the character a little bit more to sort of say, no, this isn't just an unnamed narrator who is looking for a book in a library and needs a room. Um, I mean, there is a conscious kind of um, connection, I think, in plot terms where, with, between Watson and uh, the narrator, where they both are looking for lodgings at, at one point and end and up shacking up with, with the detective. That's a conscious throwback. I think, you know, Watson needs a room, he meets Sherlock Holmes and they move in together. The narrator does exactly the same thing. There is a connection that's obviously being forged there. Um, but I think Doyle's kind of doing it more consciously with a view to sort of creating this person as a character with their own kind of story and interests because fiction itself has sort of developed a little bit more. And also it can kind of present a far more realistic um, form of narrative. I mean, Watson himself forges such good <laughs> narratives and you combine that with um, the setting in a sort of periodical sense and the way that they're written as a sort of retrospective set of diary entries, if you want to call them those, um, kind of really did foster this idea that Sherlock Holmes was a real person um, and uh, and he still receives mail, um, I think, as if he was a real person. or He, he definitely received a hell of a lot of mail uh, from people asking him to solve crimes because they thought he was real. And so, yeah, the, the kind of position of the, narr the narrative voice as, as, as kind of filtered through another person definitely is something that, that Doyle is borrowing uh, from Poe, 100%, yeah. Does he seem like a reliable narrator or an unreliable narrator, sir? I think Watson is 
a complex narrator. I mean, he's he's obviously um, very open to Holmes's methodologies, but he's also quite cynical at the same time. Um, his expressions of awe uh, get a little repetitive because he should be used to it by now, uh, by the time it gets to the end of the story. You know Holmes is going to solve it and you know it's going to be something you didn't get. He does get used to it. He does kind of um, become more and more enamoured with Holmes's methodologies and comes to trust him. Um, what I like about Watson as a narrator is that he's very open about that. So he's very kind of like clear at the beginning, particularly of the home stories. I don't believe, if you like, that, that Holmes is going to be able to do this. It's, he's kind of a level of incredulity. Um, is, it's kind of always there as a sort of surface tension um, in, in the earlier ones. And then the narrative kind of develops across the stories into one of trust. You know, I, I know I don't understand how Holmes works, um, but at the same time, I kind of don't have to. Um, because I know it will always work uh, by the end of it. I kind of trust Watson's voice um, as much as I can. I think I like him as a character and that's hard to dissociate yourself from. I trust the narrator less because we don't know anything about him. Um, and that's uh, that's a tough line to, to walk, I think. Oh, thank you, sir. You're welcome. Uh, uh, when, uh, if, that is, if that comes a novel in the next... Uh, decade or so, where uh, we see Sherlock Holmes' story from his own perspective, mm. about how he solves crimes and how about how he handles his addiction to uh, drugs. Do you think that will be an interesting read uh, the same way it is now? Yeah, yeah I mean, I think it would, it would be. I would, I would be suspicious of a narrative that purports to kind of tell Holmes' story in his own words. Any new one, anyway. Um, simply because a part of the appeal of Sherlock Holmes as a character is his mystique, is the unknown. You know, we don't know anything about Sherlock Holmes. We know very little about his early life. We know very little about his friends, his networks. You know, we are, I mean, I mentioned sort of damaged detectives before, you know, where they've gone, undergone some kind of traumatic experience. And a lot of the time we know what those are and we sympathise or we, or we empathise with, with the detective and we can sort of see why they act the way they do. Um, but with Sherlock Holmes, it's a kind of interesting case study because his, his kind of cerebral mystique, where did he get his abilities from? How is that nurtured? How was it forged? What happened to him? Uh, is part of his appeal because we want to know more. I, I think a lot of people love Sherlock Holmes simply because they want to be the one who's, who finally cracks him. You know, you know he's, he's the biggest mystery, if you like. And that's a real cliched thing to say. But I think a lot of people are kind of enamored by Sherlock Holmes simply because we want to be the one who figures it out. We want to be the one who solves him. And that's um, something that I think it would destroy if a narrative, a sort of canonical narrative, if you want to call it that, um, kind of appeared to sort of say, this is the story of Sherlock Holmes and this is how it is that he became who he is. Um, I think it would kind of cause us to lose that mystique. A little bit more and there have been plenty of, of, of adaptations that sort of show Holmes in childhood or um, Holmes's descendants or Holmes in his university years there's even a, a, a series called Young Sherlock Holmes you know there are um, origin stories if you want to call it that and the connection between detectives and superheroes is something I need to look into because there's definitely something there um, and uh, so the kind of origin story of Sherlock Holmes is, is um, it's been done um, it's never been done to a point where anyone is willing to accept that that's the truth, if you want to put that in inverted commas, because to the end, to, at the end of the day, I think we all love the mystery of Sherlock Holmes a little bit more than we want to find it out. Um, and so it, I would read it, and I would be interested, but at the same time I would go, there's probably something better, because there's always going to be something better, I think, and we want the mystery more than we do the solution. And I think that, can, that holds true for crime fiction more generally. That's why we constantly want more. We get the solution to the mystery at the end of whatever it is that we're reading. And the first thing we do is pick up another one because we, we want to be mystified um, a lot of the time. And I think we love that more than we do the solution to the crime. Thank you, Dr. Saunders, uh, for uh, your interesting take on Sherlock Holmes' uh, hmm. canon. Uh, next question comes from Anusha Hegde. Uh, this seems to be a two-sentence question. I will read it uh, one after the other. Are moors and the countryside generally seen more as sites of intrigue, mystery, and crime in detective fiction? If so, can we say that the uninhabited spaces are similar to the human unconscious? Oh, that's a very complex and, and deep question. Um, the countryside, it, it's an interesting case study, kind of in the history uh, of detective fiction. 
because there is an interesting kind of tension that existed in reality, at least in the UK, um, between the kind of new sort of march of progress um, with the official police kind of taking root in cities first and then kind of spreading out into the countryside where things were a little bit more um, slow to develop. And there was resistance to this kind of idea, um, particularly across the kind of early 19th century where um, police forces kind of sprung up in places like London or Birmingham or Manchester or Liverpool uh, and then kind of spread out exponentially. And there were a few kind of failed experiments in, in, in countryside or rural locations where um, the kind of system was still to have a kind of local person as a night watchman who did it kind of voluntarily because they were part of the community kind of thing. And that kind of tension still sort of exists at the end of the 19th century. So you've got your sort of local <coughs> uh, police officer or detective who is often superseded by the person who comes from the big city to fix the problem. Um, and so Holmes does this quite a lot. So you'll have a sort of local crime that's taken place somewhere in I don't know, rural Gloucestershire or something like somewhere like that. And um, he'll sort of take a train and he'll wander over and he'll sort of meet with the local law enforcement um, agencies and they won't want him there. And this still happens, you know, we don't want this interloper from the big city coming and telling us how to do our job, that kind of thing. Um, so the kind of uninhabited space of rural locations um, is an interesting tension because it's seen as both a desirable place to be but at the same time as a place where there is a lot more unknown. So um, there are long running TV series here, like Midsummer Murders, that are specifically placed in rural locations because they are simultaneously quaint and non-threatening and slow and relaxed and a place you go on holiday, that kind of thing. And yet at the same time, they are scary. You know, there are processes you don't understand. There are uh, locations that are sinister, you know, abandoned buildings, abandoned churches, castles, woodland, you know, there are places you don't like to go at night, there's no light. Um, and these are um, the kind of opposite side, if you like, to that kind of comfortable existence. And, and um, we use that, I think, um, quite effectively to say, look, this is somewhere that should be non-threatening, but at the same time, it kind of is. And, and yeah, I think the the kind of reading um, the, 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 the question performs into whether that can kind of manifest something in our subconscious is an interesting kind of psychoanalytic perspective on crime fiction that could be pursued. Absolutely. Does, does the, the kind of movement into a rural setting tell us something about our anxieties, about where we experience criminality? Um, the, the thing I'd be most interested to kind of explore is that kind of sinister underlying criminality that can exist in a rural space as juxtaposed with the criminality that exists in the inner city space that may otherwise be more visible. We expect criminality in the city. Um, we might not be able to see it, but we know it's there. Um, and we've got the, the kind of visible presence of the police or even the audible presence of the police, you know, a, a kind of like signifying trope if you like of criminality in a city space is to hear a police siren even if you can't see it you know you know that that city space is criminalized simply because if the window is open you can hear a police officer somewhere um in the in the countryside you don't expect that so it might be um interesting to kind of say well we've got all this these ideas about latent criminality um in the city that you can't see, but there might be just as much in the countryside or in a, in a rural setting that we can't see that's actually more dangerous because it's unexpected. Um, and that might tell us quite a lot about ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Saunders, for answering that question. Sure. Next question comes from Sarvesh, and uh, he asks, do we have characters similar to Sherlock Holmes in present day writing? Oh, um, yeah, that's quite a few. I think not, not so many... Um, cerebral detectives that are focused on it in the same way because they kind of inevitably end up um, being compared, if you like, to Sherlock Holmes. So if you were to sort of create a private consulting detective who has that similar kind of reasoning ability and the kind of aloof, abrupt or brash kind of relationship with other people, you might end up sort of getting into a territory where um, you are um, sort of creating a pastiche of Sherlock Holmes and your book is inevitably going to be compared to Sherlock Holmes all the time. So we're having to navigate um, the, how, how do we create a new detective that's got some kind of elevating characteristic, that's got a way of being isolated, that's sort of uh, a likable enough character that can drive the narrative forwards. Um, and how is it not going to be compared to Sherlock Holmes inevitably, I think. And um, there are quite a few characters, I think, that sort of perform that quite well. And over the years from sort of the golden age to now, 
we've seen hundreds of detectives that have all kind of got that cerebral quality, but have all got um, a kind of defining characteristic that kind of makes them slightly different to any other. I think that sort of creates that that sort of appeal, if you like. Um, the kind of rise of the sort of airport novel style of crime fiction, I think, is a place where we can see a lot of the more contemporary stuff in action. Um, the kind of focus on the scientific discovery of detection, you know, the sort of forensic side of things is a kind of new arm of detective fiction as well. Um, but they are they are all branching out from from those early 19th century roots. So yeah, we've absolutely got characters who are similar. Um, I couldn't name any off the top of my head, not without going through my bookshelf. Um, but um, yeah, the, the kind of process of detection is, is definitely still there. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Saunders, for answering your, the question. Uh, next question comes from uh, P is captain of the Peapods. That is a username. Uh, his question is, uh, there must be characters like Sherlock Holmes since there are a lot of crime slash detective novels. Is, is this a question? Right. Uh, he says that he will be reading the final cut by Catherine Coulter this month. Uh, that doesn't end with the question. Maybe we should move on to the next. Maybe he's asking his opinion. I hope he enjoys it. Uh, the, uh, maybe he's asking uh, Dr. Saunders' opinion of uh, Catherine Coulter. It's not what not a series I'm particularly familiar with, but I hope they enjoy it. Okay, sir. Uh, I think that's about it, sir. The final question was uh, how uh, Sherlock Holmes uh, is uh, characterized in a, I mean, how, uh, do we have characters similar to Sherlock Holmes? That was the final question. And yeah, before we begin this Q&A session, uh, I would like, like to ask my question, sir. Sure. Um, we have talked about detective fiction uh, throughout the day, uh, and uh, your lecture uh, uh, covered nearly all areas of uh, the history and development of the genre. Uh, when we get into the comic book genre, do we see Batman as a detective protagonist? <laughs> <laughs> you know, my colleague, uh, I have a colleague who I work because with. he has a uh, childhood uh, that is traumatic for him and uh, that childhood uh, incident uh, enables him to become a detective and we almost see him as a detective in uh, all the chapters of the comic books. No, I absolutely agree. Like I say, there's, uh, I've got a colleague who I worked with at University Center Shrewsbury and she is an expert on, on Batman. Um, and their kind of position or our, our positioning him as, as, as the world's greatest detective, which is what he's called uh, in the very earliest comic book. So you, I think I think I should sort of defer, if you like, to, to her expertise on this one. But I'll say a couple of things on it with the with the caveat that I am in no way an expert about comic books in, 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 uh, in any way. But I think the kind of ger germ of an idea I've got in my head about Batman um, as a detective kind of figure is that... Um, kind of connection with the isolated nature of the detective, the damaged kind of uh, figure we have um, of, a, of a detective as well, who has kind of a, a personal reason to solve crime um, or has some kind of traumatic experience that somehow lends them lends themselves to, to crime solving um, on their own, if you like. And, you know, so Batman obviously loses his parents when he's very young. He turns to, he, he has that kind of traumatic experience where he sort of becomes has a phobia of bats and uses that to draw strength um, and then t transforms himself into another kind of figure and uses that kind of veneer or identity, if you like, to, to operate as a detective. It's um, all the ego. The, yeah, yeah, exactly. And the, the kind of super ability, if you like, of the superhero is very closely related, I think, to um, the individual characteristic I mentioned of detectives before. So we've said that, you know, Sherlock Holmes has his supreme reasoning ability. Lord Peter Whimsey is an aristocrat. Um, Poirot is Belgian in living in a British situation, if you like. They're all othered in some way. Uh, they are all positioned as external and have some kind of ability that allows them to go anywhere. So, you know, Lord Peter Whimsey uses his aristocratic nature to be able to penetrate a space and say, look, I'm an aristocrat, you have to let me in. And he d and they do. And so Batman kind of does a very similar thing, but he they, or superheroes in general have a very kind of more overt super ability that allows them to do things that other people don't. And all of this, I think, is um, a kind of reference, if you like, to our own anxieties, our own desire to be protected by someone who has an ability that we don't. 
um, detectives are capable of solving crimes. They have powers of arrest. They have, or they have a supreme kind of ability, if you like, that means that they could solve crimes more effectively than we do. The superheroes have kind of more visible superpowers that we don't. Um, and we are anxious about our own kind of situation um, and our own kind of uh, position, I guess, against the criminal threat that we against which we're powerless and we want people to be out there protecting us and and superheroes do that and so do detectives uh, and and batman is a real interesting kind of moment where we transition from one to the other we sort of say we've got detectives but we've also got people who've actually got physical powers if you like um i mean batman's powers are um a little bit more diminished i suppose in the face of other superheroes who've got sort of actual kind of abilities if you like or is he's sort of just very sort of intelligent um, I don't really know where I'm going to go with that, but he's definitely got abilities that are elevated above the everyday person, just like the detective. So you can definitely draw a connection between the, the fictional detective and the fictional superhero. Yeah, absolutely. And there is a reason that Batman's called the world's greatest detective. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Sanders, for uh, patiently uh, sitting down and answering all your questions after uh, oh, your wonderful lecture. Uh, mm. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, Dr. Sanders, we have... Uh... Uh, the viewers are uh, posting their questions uh, during the last moment. Can we go ahead with that? Uh, two more questions. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one has asked, uh, what is Sherlock Holmes known for? Uh, Sherlock Holmes is known for um, acting as a, well, he, he's called a private consulting detective. That's the, uh, the term he gives himself. Um, and that's kind of how he earns his fame. So he is known for... Um, reasoning his way through crimes that um, the police have usually failed to solve or that a private client would rather uh, have someone who isn't affiliated with the police actually do, um, usually because they've done something wrong themselves. But he is, uh, yeah, he's a consulting detective. Okay, there's one more question from uh, Ms. Kamala Narayan. Can you tell us a few words about 221 Baker Street? Ah, yes, I can. Um, 221B Baker Street is a, obviously it's Sherlock Holmes' address, that's where he lives. Um, it's a, it's not a, it isn't, it isn't a real address in London. Baker Street is obviously a real street and, and, and does exist. 221B um, doesn't exist as an actual address, 221 does. Um, it is near Marylebone, uh, if that helps. But um, the Sherlock Holmes Museum is now located roughly where they, they believe the, the address to actually be set on one of the last remaining Victorian terraces. Um, and the actual address, there's an interesting kind of story around that. The, the old headquarters building of a building society in Britain kind of took over a, a kind of range of addresses on Baker Street um, when they kind of put up a sort of Art Deco building. Um, and... Um, the 221B kind of address was amalgamated into that building because it's obviously quite long, so it's it's taken over a few numbers. And um, Abbey National, the uh, the building society, did employ a permanent secretary to Sherlock Holmes to respond to mail that was sent to 221B Baker Street um, and had to reply to most of the letters that came in until the building was vacated quite recently and it's now empty. Uh, but 221B Baker Street does exist. It, it, it's not listed as, as that actual address. It's part of a larger building. A couple of doors up, the Sherlock Holmes Museum is there as a, uh, and across the road, Baker Street Tube Station uh, is there as well and it has lots of references to Sherlock Holmes as well and a statue uh, outside as well. And it's worth visiting if anyone ever gets a chance um, because it is a great place to go. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, so much. Thank you Dr. Saunders. Uh, our real final question comes from Rohini Raja and uh, uh, the question goes like this. Can we find markers of generic detective fiction as opposed to other authors in Sherlock Holmes's canon? Can we find markers of detective fiction? Generic detective fiction as opposed to other authors in Sherlock Holmes's canon? I think so. Yeah, there are. I mean, uh, Sherlock Holmes's kind of narrative structure helped to sort of cement the way we see detective fiction now. So um, he's kind of establishing a lot of those generic conventions, you know, that uh, moment where the client comes in, describes what it is they want, the process of reasoning through it, um, the kind of traveling to the, the, the location, examining the crime scene and then revealing the solution at the end. You know, that kind of narrative format that fits so well into the short story that, that readers were consuming at the end of the 19th century um, is really established by this kind of writing. 
uh, at least in, in in very popular terms. There are I've kind of argued myself that other forms of writing that came before it really sort of fit into that narrative um, already, and and that Holmes is kind of borrowing from that. But it, it definitely cemented its popularity, absolutely. Uh, so when you're looking for tropes or markers of the genre in, in Sherlock Holmes, it's worth remembering that a lot of the time, this is one of the earliest incarnations of this in 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 practice. And what's quite interesting is that sort of very sort of soon after the Holmes stories, even occasionally while they're still being published, you know, sort of in the 1920s, sort of ended in the 1920s and late 1920s but there is sort of overlap with that sort of golden age tradition of detective fiction where that trope of the butler did it is already a trope you know it's quite interesting how um our cliches if you like of the genre became cliches unbelievably quickly um and there's not that many examples if you like that had to happen before it becomes a cliche so um when we look for sort of generic markers if you like in in the Sherlock Holmes stories it's worth remembering that they are um, quite early on in the genre's development, but at the same time, they become those generic markers unbelievably quickly. You know, when you've read five stories uh, out of the 50 or 60 that, that exist, um, you start to sort of see the Hallmark characteristics popping up and you think, oh, I see where this is going. And it's, it's so quick uh, for us to start seeing things as, as cliche, but that's part of the appeal of crime fiction. It's, it's simultaneously dangerous and safe at the same time. Yeah, the patterns will form by itself when you keep reading detective fiction for years. Uh, thank you, Dr. Saunders. Uh, with, thank that, you, uh, uh, with that, we end the Q&A session and I hand over the session to Mr. Bray. Well, uh, we certainly had a lot of fun uh, beginning the lecture with uh, the actual history of how detective, detective fiction came to be and we picked apart the different aspects that go inside a narrative that talks about detective fiction. We also uh, made a deep analysis of a character uh, or the detective, actual detective, the protagonist of uh, detective narratives. And uh, <clears throat> the Q&A session was quite, in particular, was uh, quite interesting with uh, so many different questions that were met with uh, wonderful answers from uh, our uh, subject expert. And uh, I think uh, expert library will serve the purpose of bringing in <clears throat> the knowledge banks of so many different people all over the world and uh, this is uh, a community building platform where we can share our ideas and uh, our ideas expand instead of uh, uh, they are uh, they, will, they will reach many places and i uh, show hope that uh, our endeavor will continue uh, in, a, uh, in a for a very long time uh, with so many different uh, uh, subject experts taking part in expert library and to our viewers Thank you for tuning in and thank you for uh, sticking until the end of the show and hope you subscribe and join us again with the next episode of Expert Library. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.